Um, welcome, everybody. I'm uh, Professor Joe Kane. I'm a, a historian and philosopher of science, and I'm the head of the Science and Technology Studies Department here at UCL, everyone's favorite department. So, <laughs> so uh, on behalf of us and STS and, and uh, the organizers and everything else going on around Drake University, welcome to the keynote lecture. There's lots happening. I hope you had enough to eat. Um, and there'll be posters later. Uh, in the meantime, we've got a just a phenomenally good lecture coming for you, so no pressure. <laughs> um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Carlos Frank. Um, he is a director of the Institute of Computational Cosmology at uh, Durham University. I was going to say Durham University, but there you go. Or is that for Computational Cosmology? <laughs> He's an Ogden professor of fundamental physics, and uh, he's the principal investigator of the uh, Virgo Consortium, which may mean nothing to us. Principal investigator means you're the boss, and you control a lot of money. The Virgo Consortium, think the biggest computer you can imagine, triple it, and then make it even more powerful. The Virgo Consortium is super duper computing, uh, all brought together to do what's called computational cosmology, which is to build uh, complex mathematical models focused on building uh, models of the universe, asking fundamental questions about how did the universe come to be, how did it evolve, and what we all want to know is where is it going? So what's going to happen to us? So the Virgo Consortium is, is not just fancy name, it's massive computers to ask massive questions, and he's in charge of it. That's the important thing to say. Um, <laughs> Professor Frank, uh, uh, as I said, builds models of the universe, and to get to those very fundamental questions, uh, his research, he says himself, his research spans uh, cosmology, large scale structures in the universe, how galaxies form, and uh, simulations about other kinds of cosmic structures. And what's exciting about that is he's come here to be able to tell us about some of those. What we're going to do is uh, after his lecture, there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions, and then we'll all move on to the poster session and the other posters. But before we get there, please join me in welcoming Professor Carlos. Yeah. I will keep that to the end. You may not want to do that again. Uh, so thank you very much for that very nice introduction. I was having a great time listening to you there, and I was hoping you go on for a bit longer. So I was trying to remember where my lecture starts, but uh, it starts here. Uh, I'm going to tell you, essentially, for the next 50 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking about nothing, uh, because we think the universe came from nothing. Now, so let me just say, before I start talking about nothing, what a pleasure it is to be here. And uh, I'm very, very impressed by this event, uh, and I really, it's a luxury event. And coming here this morning, I remember when I first arrived as a student in Cambridge in 1976, there was a Mexican society, which I uh, established contact with. And the Mexican society had four people in it. They were all men, and they had a very strange religion. They worshipped worship the god, not tequila. tequila. <laughs> uh, so I had a very good time with them, and it's so impressive to see, first of all, so many of you. I think in those days there were only a handful of us in the country, but also to see the amazing organization and the excellent program. I'd like to congratulate uh, Dr. Thieu, who uh, and his colleagues, who uh, in fact uh, interviewed me a few years ago, and here I am as a result of that. So uh, why I know you've all been to lectures today, and it's the end of the day, so um, I will try to um, make it as difficult as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to be talking about is uh, uh, as Ken you said, it is the universe, cosmology. And uh, cosmology asks some of the biggest questions that uh, humanity has asked since the beginning of civilization. I often say that uh, the beginning of civilization is really when our ancestors began to ask these sort of questions. So the questions are uh, big questions, like how did the universe begin? Uh, what is it made of? How did it get to be the way it is today? And as Professor Kane would like to know, what does the future hold? I might be disappointed, but uh, I'll do my best. Now, I must say that uh, 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 being a Mexican, uh, I have a cosmology in my blood because uh, Mexico has a great tradition in astronomy going back 
to the Mayans, and before many of you would have seen these one of the most ancient observatories in uh, Chichen Itza, uh, the Mayans had very, very advanced astronomical knowledge, and uh, I'm sure they wondered about some of these questions as well. Now, so, however, unlike the Mayans, who of course uh, uh, did not much physics, and unlike uh, other people who asked these questions, these are not questions that uh, only uh, cosmologists ask, many other people ask similar questions, philosophers, uh, theologians, artists. Unlike them, and unlike the Mayans, modern uh, cosmology is based on a very well defined methodology that relies on the laws of physics. Now, for those of you who have the misfortune of not being physicists, <laughs> I'll remind you that uh, what the laws of physics are, these are your general rules about uh, the way nature behaves, about phenomena. Uh, they are almost invariably, not always, but almost yeah, uh, derived from experiments carried out here on laboratories on Earth. They are then uh, expressed in mathematical language, which allows one to manipulate these ideas and develop them further. So examples are Newton's law of gravitation, Einstein's theory of relativity, and so on. So most of them are experimentally discovered here on Earth. But what is uh, really one of the great mysteries really about studying the universe is that for a possibly profound reason, these same laws of physics that uh, we know about in the laboratory seem to apply everywhere. Everywhere in the universe, at all places, and at all times, even in conditions that have no resemblance whatsoever to those in which the laws were discovered in the first place, for example, at the beginning of our universe. Uh, and this universality of the laws of physics is at the same time a profound mystery and an extremely powerful tool because it allows you to use what we know here on Earth to try to study our universe as a whole. So um, the universe, uh, the building blocks of the universe are galaxies. Here's an example of a galaxy very similar to the Milky Way, but really uh, galaxies are collections of uh, up to 100 billion stars or so, and uh, we live in a galaxy, as I say, similar to this one, and the sun here uh, is located two-thirds of the way from the center <laughs> of the Milky Way galaxy. Now let me get you to put you in the right mood. I'm going to show you a movie, which requires me to switch the lights off. So of course, it's something you're not really allowed to do nowadays. So you are here, good. Um, and uh, this is a movie that uh, is a sort of tour of our local universe, uh, uh, done, uh, made by a colleague of mine in Hawaii, Brent Tully. Everything you're going to see in this movie is actually out there. It's so all based on real astronomical data. And here, uh, we first head towards the constellation of Orion that many of you will recognize. And uh, this uh, is something called the Orion Nebula. It's a cloud, gas, and dust, and um, in this cloud, new stars are being born. The Milky Way makes about one new star every year. Uh, here's another famous uh, nebula called the Horsehead Nebula for obvious reasons, and here too, young stars are being born. Now, in fact, uh, most stars are actually like to be born in small groups. Here's the Carina Nebula, and if you look closely enough, you see that actually there's not just one young star, but several being born at the same time. From this gas uh, and dust in this cloud. But not all these nebulae are actually the birthplaces of stars, some of them are the opposite. Uh, here is uh, uh, the Crab Nebula, which is exactly the opposite. This is the graveyard of the star that uh, run out of nuclear fuel because stars are powered by uh, nuclear reactions in the center. This one ran out of nuclear fuel and uh, it died and it expelled the outer layers. And you can see the electric kinds of color pulsar, which you can see pulsating in there. So we're now going to, uh, this is the only bit of uh, artistic license in this movie, we're going to leave our galaxy, because we cannot do that, uh, and uh, uh, have a look at it from the top, and uh, the um, uh, galaxy is about uh, 50,000 uh, light years across. It takes about 50,000 years for a message from Earth to reach the other side of the galaxy. Now, so this, uh, these are neighbors of the Milky Way, the large and small Magellanic clouds, and now we're going to head towards our nearest uh, large neighbor called the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, and uh, the Andromeda Galaxy lies about 2.1 million light years away. Is that one? It's a companion called M32, which itself has its own clouds of gas and dust. Uh, again, making stars roughly at the same rate, about one new star per year. So this is our nearest neighbor, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy. And uh, 
Uh, we're now going to head to a cluster of galaxies here called Virgo. Uh, but before we do that, we'll take a little tour to admire some of these incredible things nature has managed to make. And also to recognize that the distribution of galaxies is not random. Uh, galaxies are structured, and that structure tells us a lot about how the universe began. Here's a galaxy that's uh, eating a neighbor over there, it's interacting with a neighbor. And then finally, we head towards the uh, variable cluster of galaxies, which is about uh, 10 million light years away. It's 10 million. So the light we see here, we traveling to us for the last 10 million years. So we're not seeing it as it is today. We see it as it was 10 million years ago. And in the center of the variable cluster, there's a big galaxy called M87, which is very famous because in the center of M87, there's a gigantic black hole that weighs uh, a billion times as much as the sun. We now know that all galaxies, or all big galaxies, have black holes like that in the center, including the Milky Way. And here uh, you can see the effects of the digestion of the black hole as it is sitting around it uh, in that form of that jet. So that's what the universe around us looks like. And uh, let me put some lights. Oh, not so many lights. Uh, this is this must be. Uh, when it says low, it means bright. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's UCL though. You see a low, yes. Anyway, so let's go for low. All right, uh, I have some more movies I'll switch this off later. But, so that, that is a universe around us, and um, uh, there are, uh, a galaxy like the Milky Way has about, uh, as I said, uh, 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 10 or so billion uh, or, uh, stars or so, uh, a few more than that, but about 50 billion stars. And there is roughly about the same number galaxies in the visible universe, coincidentally. So there are many, many galaxies in the universe, and many stars, and yet uh, uh, the material of which galaxies and stars and planets and people are made of accounts for only about 5% of what the universe contains. So only about 5% of the universe is what we call ordinary matter, that is matter in the form of atoms, uh, the atoms that we are made of and with which we are familiar. About 25% of what the universe contains is something very different, uh, something that doesn't shine in any uh, wavelength, and uh, it's so dark, uh, uh, we call it dark matter. It produces gravity, but it is completely visible, completely dark. And as I will show you in a minute, it's very different from the matter that uh, we are familiar with here on Earth. The lion's shade of the universe is something even more strange, something that was only discovered quite recently, known as dark energy. And um, one of the great puzzles of modern science is the fact that, that we don't really know, uh, we don't know much about dark energy, we know a little bit about dark matter, but we don't really know yet what these two the dominant components of our universe actually are. So let me tell you a bit about dark energy. As I said, we don't know much about dark energy, and in fact, uh, uh, I only have a couple of slides, and by the time I finish with those two slides, you know more or less as much as any of my professional colleagues, because <laughs> <laughs> you really don't know much about this at all. I think it's only very bizarre. So, the, uh, so the, uh, first of all, let me take a step back and uh, uh, remind you that in 1929, Edward Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe. It's a picture of Hubble in the days when physicists were allowed to smoke in their offices. <laughs> discovered that uh, all galaxies are moving away from us at a velocity that increases in proportion to distance. So everything is moving away from us actually except M31, except, except, except Andromeda that I showed you before, coming to our system, but all, all the galaxies are actually moving away from us. It discovered the expansion of the universe. Now before you get alarmed, uh, and it's not just that we're in the center of the universe, uh, it is really a phenomenon that every observer would measure in exactly the same way. So imagine that this is a Milky Way galaxy and that observers in other galaxies, and imagine that uh, uh, this lab is, uh, you heat it up and it expands, then uh, you would see every observer would see exactly the same thing. Every galaxy or every observer in any galaxy would see all of the galaxies moving away from them. So the expansion is actually universal. It's not a problem here. Uh, that, uh, it's not that well at the center of the universe. Every other observer a prophetical observer would measure exactly the same thing. So we learn about the expansion of the universe for, uh, well, almost getting on for 100 years, and that is the basis of modern cosmology. 
However, uh, in the, at the end of last century, a very important discovery was made. Not only is the universe expanding, but the expansion is getting faster and faster and faster. So the expansion is accelerating. Now, that, at first sight, might not sound very strange. The universe is expanding, but it's getting quicker and quicker. But if you think about it, it's absolutely bizarre. Because uh, if all the universe contained was matter, matter produces gravity, and gravity, as the Americans like to say, gravity sucks. Maybe <laughs> gravity would try to slow down the expansion because it would be attracting material uh, further out. And so if all the universe contained was matter, then the expansion should be slowing down. Instead, what uh, we observe is exactly the opposite. Something seems to be pushing galaxies uh, apart in a way that makes it move at greater and greater speed. Uh, we don't know what that is, so that is uh, even the word Dark Energy, which basically means nobody knows exactly what it is. But even though we don't know what the Dark Energy is, uh, that uh, discovery is so important that it earned the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. Now, it really is a very bizarre phenomenon. And the reason for that is this. Uh, most of space is completely empty, totally empty. So imagine there's a galaxy here, another galaxy there. There's nothing in between. It's all empty. It's most of space is empty, it's a vacuum. And yet, these galaxies are experiencing a repulsive force that seems to come from nothing. And so this is very, very strange. And uh, we don't really have any idea what the dark energy is, but it seems to be whatever it is, it's something associated with empty space that produces some form of repulsive force that is not understood at all within modern physics. So it seems to have something to do with the vacuum, with empty space. Now, one thing we do know in physics, contrary to what you might think uh, about the word vacuum, uh, in physics, the vacuum is actually not empty. The vacuum is very, very interesting. Uh, it's, in fact, full of something, full of energy that we call vacuum energy. And I tried to make a movie of the vacuum energy. Uh, this is the best I could do. Uh, and that's how I imagine the vacuum. Now, to interpret this movie, just imagine you have some kind of chamber in a laboratory, a vacuum chamber. Imagine you take everything out of it with a pump. You take every uh, molecule of everything until there's nothing in it. And then, if you were able to examine that vacuum, that nothingness, with a sufficiently sensitive instrument, this is what you would see. You would see what we call virtual particles uh, of matter and antimatter emerging out of nowhere. Uh, and then, as matter and mat antimatter do, when they collide, they annihilate, decaying into energy, which in turn decays into matter and antimatter, uh, which is then the case, and this process keeps going on and on and on. And it is the basis of quantum physics. Your, your, uh, your iPhone uh, works, whatever phone you have, uh, works thanks to this. It's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the fact that, that the vacuum actually has energy, and that uh, this energy consists of particles that emerge out of nowhere, disappear into nowhere. And this bubbling is what we call the vacuum energy. So we don't know what the dark energy is, but uh, it almost certainly has to do with this vacuum, and uh, because it has to do with empty space. So that's it uh, about dark energy. Uh, nobody has anything more to say about that. Uh, and uh, if they do, don't take it seriously. Because it really <laughs> is uh, a very it's a frontier to physics, and we don't even know where to start uh, trying to understand it. Now, we know a lot more about dark matter. Uh, that's what I work on. And let me tell you a little bit about that. So firstly, as I said, the dark matter is invisible. How do we know it's there? Well, that is a beautiful example of the power of physics. Uh, and in this case, of Newton's theory of gravity. Astronomers are very good at measuring how things move. And in particular, how stars move uh, round and round the center of a galaxy. Now, uh, when this measurement is done, Something very strange happens. Uh, astronomers recognized already 40 years ago that the stars are moving much too fast to be held in place by the gravity of the material that you can see, by the gravity of the stars and gas clouds that you can see, is nowhere near enough to keep the stars going at the speed at which they're going. So galaxies seem to be rotating much too fast to be kept in place by the gravity of the material that you can see. I must say, I was walking in London the other day. I was thinking about this, I was slightly confused. I was really lucky I ran into Newton. 
And so he explained to me that uh, uh, the stars really, as I just said, are too fast to be held in place by the gravity of uh, the visible matter. And so the way you should think about a galaxy is a, a pool of stars sitting in the center of a big block of dark matter that keeps the galaxy in place. And uh, we call these uh, dark halos because as astronomers, we have uh, saintly you know, inclination, so we think about halos a lot. Uh, and this really long dark matter, it's called the dark matter halo. Now, so what is the dark matter? Well, that is a big question. Uh, we don't know the answer for sure, but we suspect um, there's many nice of evidence that support this view that whatever the dark matter is, it's almost certainly a particle, an elementary particle that was created very soon after the Big Bang, when the universe was about a billion of a second old. At this time, I'll tell you more about that later, uh, the universe had cooled enough that particles could be created, and uh, some of these, which go by the name of cold dark matter, might have been created then, and they would provide the dark matter today. These particles would die very quickly, uh, mostly just to gravity, so they're very difficult to detect, but they've been around since the very beginnings of our universe. So that is the uh, working assumption of 99.99% uh, uh, of physicists. That uh, the dark matter is some form of elementary particle created in the universe, but very different from the atoms, from the particles that make the atoms, that make our sun, uh, our air, and our own bodies. Something very different. And I think most physicists would agree with it. Now, I was surprised actually that um, when the German Chancellor was asked what is the dark matter, she knew too. She said, yes, she said it's an elementary particle. Now, that is not very surprising, because she's actually a physicist. She's got a PhD in physics, uh, solid state physics, but still physics. But um, <laughs> here's uh, our prime minister here, who really didn't get the right idea about what the dark one is, and uh, he suffered for that. <laughs> So here it is, the more enlightened man who doesn't even say it's an elementary particle. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if any of you are going to Mexico soon, maybe you can talk about it. <laughs> tell you that's the way things are. That's not the way physics works at all. In physics, we don't take anybody's word for it. Uh, in physics, uh, this is a law of the Royal Society, it, uh, it says don't take anything, uh, don't, don't believe anybody's words, don't take anything for granted, uh, go and find evidence for it. So this is one of the basic uh, lessons of modern science, that uh, evidence is really what it's all about. So, we, before we really know what the dark matter is, we need to go look for it. And uh, that is the domain of experimental physics. And uh, has any, has any, are there any experimental physicists yet? Um, I don't know if um, you've ever seen one. I'll show you what they look like. <laughs> <laughs> experimental physicists um, trying to look for dark matter. Of course, uh, finding the dark matter is hard because, as I say, it doesn't interact with anything. So if the dark matter is what I think it is, this room is full of it. And that billions of particles of dark matter going through your body every second, but they just go straight through and you don't feel anything and they don't do any harm. The problem is uh, because they don't interact, they only interact with gravity. The problem, however, is that uh, if you try to detect them, they just go through the detector and they don't need any signal. So that's why it's so hard uh, to find these things. Uh, there are experiments at the bottom of mines. Here is one uh, very close to where I am in the northeast of England called the Bowlby Mine, and at the bottom of this is a very high-tech experiment. 
trying to search for dark matter. If, if, uh, if I need a drink later, I'll tell you what it's like. My project is I got a picture, and uh, here's various uh, dignitaries, but um, you can spot the real uh, experimental physicist here, because he's the only guy here who does my <laughs> 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 So now, so I, I think the dark matter, I say that the experiment is going to find it, and I think it's going to be the great next great big news. I think it's a question just of a few years, I think, before the dark matter is discovered. I know you're saying that for one lab. Now, so, but why is it so important? Why are we so keen to find out what it is? Well, there's uh, obviously uh, the obvious reason you want to know what the universe is made of. But actually, there's more to it than that. The, uh, excuse me, sometimes I have a problem with my facts. So I sit down from time to time, but uh, it's a time is important not just because we want to know what the universe is about, but because the dark matter actually controls everything that we have in the universe. And uh, uh, the dark matter, in fact, is the agent through which structure in the universe, including galaxies, stars, planets, and all, are formed. And that is because the gravity of the dark matter drives the formation of a cosmic structure. So I want to spend a few minutes now telling you about galaxies and where do they come from. Because uh, it's a really wonderful story, uh, but we're beginning to understand in detail. Now, to answer this question, we need to go back in time to more or less the beginning of time. Uh, in fact, uh, to a time equals to a decimal point, uh, 34 zeros and 1, that fraction of a second, up to the Big Bang, which is as far back as we can do physics and still have a straight face. Uh, 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 something very important happened then. And uh, what happened then is an event that uh, goes by the name of cosmic inflation. And what happened uh, when the universe came into existence, uh, and I'm going to show you evidence for this, believe it or not, uh, the universe had vacuum energy. It had, in fact, too much vacuum energy, uh, so much vacuum energy that uh, it got rid of it by expanding very quickly in a very short period of time. That hence the name cosmic deflation. So the universe went from being the size of a proton to being the size of a football in 10 to the minus 35 seconds. And this period is known as cosmic inflation. Now, cosmic inflation is uh, the result of quantum processes, is a result of vacuum energy, and uh, vacuum energy fluctuates all the time. So during this very early phase, everything was fluctuating, and the outcome of this is that the universe ended up being seeded by tiny little irregularities that uh, were of quantum origin, but got inflated and became macroscopic objects during this early phase. So the outcome of inflation was two, two sides, two parts of it. One is the universe got rid of this vacuum energy, but at the expense of acquiring small irregularities in the density of uh, energy and matter in the early universe. And uh, the uh, proposition of modern physics is that everything we see in the universe, these amazing galaxies I show you, they all come from quantum fluctuations of vacuum during a period of cosmic inflation. That is the uh, basic idea of where galaxies come from. So let me say it again, because it's a non-trivial idea. The idea is that everything, galaxies, huge collections of billions of stars, started life as a quantum fluctuation that became a microscopic object during a period of inflation. Now, so um, that's what I just told you. And the, uh, these quantum fluctuations were then amplified and caused to evolve in a way that I will describe in a minute by the gravity of the dark matter. So those are the two main concepts we have today in cosmology to explain the origin of galaxies. Quantum fluctuations amplified by the gravity of probably all dark matter. Let me show you a movie here that uh, shows a patch of universe uh, 500 million light years across uh, this is just dark matter. Uh, he is very early on, 60 million years after the Big Bang, and uh, you don't see any structure here. It's almost uniform. It's not quite uniform. Uh, the uh, distribution here has these quantum fluctuations that I'm telling you about. And then uh, you see how gravity amplifies these quantum fluctuations, 
concrete structure to emerge essentially out of nothing and produce uh, this amazing pattern uh, of um, uh, something that I'll show you more in a minute uh, called the cosmic web. So that, uh, you saw here very quickly how this, uh, let me show it again, how these uh, uh, quantum fluctuations, which are imperceptible here at every time, are then amplified by the gravity of the magmatic uh, creating structure, as you see there. Now, so, as I said before, modern physics, uh, modern cosmology is based on the laws of physics. And um, uh, the proposition that I just described is a very bold proposition, uh, very, very crazy when you first hear about it. Uh, but to be physics, it must be tested. But I'm going to show you how we can test these ideas about what went on uh, very soon after the Big Bang, then to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang, how we can get evidence for these amazing phenomena. And, um, well, it's not uh, so hard. I mean, um, you can test these ideas. All you need is, of course, a crystal ball. And, um, <laughs> now, in cosmology, we have a crystal ball. And that is because uh, the, uh, one of the basic laws of physics is that light travels at a finite speed, 300,000 kilometers per second. So we're all told in high school or earlier. And because light takes time to go from one place to another, it brings us information about the past. I told you earlier, when we look at the Virgo cluster of galaxies, we don't see it as it is today, we see it as it was 10 million years ago, because the light has taken 10 million years to travel from Virgo to us. Well, uh, as we will see in a minute, we can actually see light that has been traveling for 14 million years, light that was emitted when the universe was very young. That is because the early universe, we know, was very hot, and then uh, as um, it has been expanding, has been cooling down. Now, the early universe, the very early universe, was very dense. It was formed. Uh, and that's because atoms had been formed. So electrons were scattered around, and light bounced off electrons, uh, producing a sort of early fog. So the very early universe, uh, very early indeed, was actually foggy. However, about uh, 350,000 years after the Big Bang, something very important happened. The first atoms in the universe formed, the electrons were captured into hydrogen atoms, and the scattering of light stopped. So light was then able to propagate freely. And that light has been propagating to us since this very early time. I should say that um, uh, for you, those of you who are not astronomers, 350,000 sounds like a lot. Uh, but for us astronomers, it's very little. So if you scale these to the age of the universe, which we now know is 13.8 billion years, uh, this epoch would be the human equivalent of one day. So this would be uh, the universe being one day old in, uh, if you scale it to a human lifetime. And this life then was free to escape uh, at this very early time. Now, this life, as I said, has been propagating uh, through the universe and that until it is here. So uh, uh, we say first that uh, the life was detected. This radiation by these two gentlemen, Arnold and Science and Bob Wilson, was detected in 1964. Accidentally, as many of the great discoveries in physics uh, or in science happened, completely accidentally, uh, they had a radio telescope and uh, we could hear a hum uh, coming from everywhere in the sky, and without realizing, they actually discovered the evidence for the Big Bang. Now, what's happened with this radiation is that it was very hot at early times. But um, as, as the universe expands, the radiation cools down. And today it's very, very cold. It's just a mere 2.7 uh, above degrees above absolute zero. That's because the universe is very old, so the radiation is very cool. And uh, uh, these are these temperatures. It, uh, it appears in the form of microwaves. And so uh, this is called the microwave pattern radiation. Now, that radiation is everywhere. And we can measure it. They discovered it, and uh, we'll see in a minute. That is measured routinely nowadays. But it's actually quite exciting that uh, if you stand outside, it, it doesn't matter if it's day or night, it's better at night, uh, you put your hand out and you will be, well, not this, but you will be intercepting photons, particles of light that have been traveling since essentially the Big Bang uninterruptedly. And the first thing they encounter is your hand. 
and you get about 100 of those per square centimeter per second. So if you're feeling depressed, just go out there. <laughs> <laughs> get the light from the back. So you won't feel anything. In the old days, we were all too young, but uh, when I was a kid, at five or three was a kid, uh, the uh, televisions got uh, uh, screens uh, made of phosphorus, uh, what was it, whatever it was, phosphorus. And um, uh, if you hit that uh, phosphorus atom, it produces radiation light, that's how televisions used to work. And uh, when there were no broadcasts at midnight or something, there was this flicker noise, and um, uh, about 10% of that flicker noise was actually <coughs> triggered by photons from the Big Bang hitting the phosphorus in the screen. Suddenly, you cannot see that anymore. Anyway, so these two chaps uh, uh, found micro background radiation, of course, they got the Nobel Prize for that. And, um, and, and that uh, radiation then gives us information about conditions in the universe when the universe was the equivalent of one day old. Now, According to the theory of inflation, early on, the universe acquires some spots due to quantum fluctuations. During this early Big Bang phase, those fluctuations were grown, but they would still be around when the microwave background is visited. Now, these are perturbations in everything, perturbations in the dark matter, perturbations in the radiation, and what that causes is to change the temperature of this radiation. When it's slightly denser, uh, it turns out to be slightly cooler than where it is slightly less dense. And so, uh, using very simple physics, one can predict the pattern uh, of uh, temperature of this radiation on the sky, and it should be characterized by hot and cold spots that are a reflection of those quantum inflation, uh, quantum perturbations surviving, quantum fluctuations surviving from inflation. Now, in fact, uh, using physics, one can make very detailed calculations of what this pattern should look like. I'm not going to explain, uh, I, there's no point going to the technical details. I'm not going to explain what this curve is. I'll tell you for the physicists here, this is just something called the power spectrum. It's a measure of the temperature difference between two points in the sky as a function of how far apart they are. The technical details don't matter. What matters is that the prediction from theory is not trivial, it's not just a line all these features and uh, that prediction was made for the first time actually in 1970 by my great teacher uh, Jim Peebles from Princeton University still around uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, in 1992 it was a very important year in cosmology and I would say in science because uh, an American satellite called the COVID satellite uh, the science of the cosmic background explorer published this picture which shows the temperature of this relic microwave background radiation left over from the Big Bang. So that's a map of the temperature of the early universe. And as you can see, it's spotty. And uh, it has a pattern of cold and hot spots. And uh, uh, this uh, discovery made headline news uh, around the world. And um, I'll be as modest as uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, pro, uh, vice, pro vice chancellor this morning. Told us he was very modest and uh, told us about his novel and so on. Well, I have to say, uh, excuse the lack of modesty, but I too made a contribution here. And as you can see in the newspaper, you can read uh, very, very closely. So it's kind of spring, and I'm starting at Durham University say yesterday, oh wow. <laughs> 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 when I die, my head is up. <laughs> anyway, so the radiation was uh, measured. Uh, oh, this uh, discovery here by George Wood, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006. Uh, and uh, it was measured with much greater uh, precision and uh, resolution a uh, decade later by the Double Mars satellite, another uh, American NASA satellite, and then 10 years later. A European satellite this time called Planck. And uh, here are the results from the Planck satellite. Now, I have to pause uh, because every time I see this picture, and I've seen it thousands of times, I, I just get uh, I become speechless, which uh, my wife says is very rare. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I'll tell you why I become speechless. So, uh, 
this is this power spectrum I mentioned before. Uh, and I say again for the uh, technically minded people, it's just a measure of the temperature difference between two points in the sky. It's a function of the angular scale, it's a large scale, it's a small scale. Doesn't matter. All you need to know is this that green or blue line here are the predictions made um, in 1970 and developed in the 1980s. Predictions made using the laws of physics, extrapolating what we know here from Earth to the beginning of our universe. Predictions based on the view that uh, there were quantum fluctuations soon after the universe came into being, and that these quantum fluctuations have been amplified by the gravity of the dark matter. That is a blue line. The points are the measurement from black. And you can see the agreement is perfect. Right. So I think, um, let me say, so, so the physics doesn't get any better than this. So if there any physics here, and you're not uh, much awestruck by this picture, go do something else. Become a <laughs> And I think science doesn't get any better than this. Now, why, why don't you say that? Well, because it really is pretty amazing that for some reason we don't really understand, somehow in this corner of Typical galaxy, like there are billions in the universe, in this little anonymous planet called the Earth, uh, a species uh, has evolved of animals uh, that have the capability to make theories about how the universe began, express these theories in mathematical language, and produce uh, predictions like this. And this same species also has the ability to build machines that are launched uh, outside the atmosphere that can make these extremely sensitive measurements because I can tell you that the amplitude of the signals is tiny. Uh, the spots are different just by one part in a hundred thousand. So to me, this is a tribute to not the science and cosmology, but to human ingenuity. This is uh, the equivalent of uh, the Roman symphony or the Brenner picture. And those who get indicated this. And that's how we know about inflation, and that's why. Uh, this idea that I put forward earlier is generally accepted as a very possible explanation for our university case structure. Now, so I've now been talking for uh, 39 minutes, according to my clock here, and I've only got as far as 380,000 years after the Big Bang. I got uh, uh, about 3.5 billion years to go uh, between here and galaxies. But I'll try to speed up a bit and tell you what happened in between. It's early time and today. And to do that, uh, to figure out how these small perturbations originated in inflation and reflected in the micro background, to figure out how they evolved, we use computers, because computers are very good at solving equations. And if we're interested, as we are in the first instance, only about the evolution of dark matter, the equations are very simple. All we need to do is solve the equations of gravity uh, with a little bit of general relativity that describes how the universe expands. And we know how to do that very really well. Uh, and here, let me show you a movie now that illustrates how these quantum fluctuations evolve uh, as a result of the computer simulation done at my institute, and uh, how these quantum fluctuations evolve into one of these clumps of dark matter called dark matter halos, like the one in which our Milky Way galaxy lives. So here's the clock uh, in billions of years, so it's 18 million years after the Big Bang. These are these quantum fluctuations. At the beginning, this was already smooth. And uh, this is just dark matter that you can see here. And the dark matter, uh, as we saw earlier, produces gravity, of course. And uh, that causes these small fluctuations to amplify and uh, give rise to these amazing patterns that uh, are said known as the cosmic web. This is not the scale version of the cosmic web. And uh, lumps are uh, forming. Uh, this time, in fact, uh, uh, less than a billion years or a third of a billion years after the Big Bang gas would cool and collect in these lumps, fragment from stars. This is roughly the time when the first stars in the universe form. I will show you a picture of stars in a minute. This is the dark matter. Uh, and, uh, and these are beautiful uh, uh, movies. And this is the result of the physics calculation. Actually, we won an art prize in Germany with, with one of these movies uh, because of uh, that uh, really uh, amazingly beautiful. But this is all just solving those simple equations in a big computer. So here is now a well-established lump whose origin was a quantum fluctuation, and it is here then that uh, the 
gas will eventually, ordinary matter that is, which is spinning, will then collect and uh, <coughs> this uh, uh, that we try to make into stars. I'm going to show you that in the movie, but before that, let's take a tour at great speed through the universe of dark matter. So if you have dark matter glasses, this is what you would see. You were able to travel uh, in, uh, very quickly, in very rapidly, this is going a huge speed here, much greater than the speed of light. If you were able to travel uh, throughout the universe, this is what you would see. Uh, this very intricate uh, uh, pattern of filaments and uh, with lumps. Uh, the intersection of these filaments is very big lumps form. This is where something like the rainbow cluster would form. Uh, and here is a uh, lump like the one in which the Milky Way galaxy would have formed. Now, so until recently, we were only able to do these dark matter simulations, and uh, uh, they take huge amounts of computer time, as Professor Kane said. Uh, but now, in the last few years, there's been a major breakthrough that's taken a long time uh, to achieve, where we can now, for the first time, simulate not just the easy part of the universe, which is the dark matter, but also we're beginning now to be able to simulate the complicated part of the universe, which is the evolution of the ordinary matter, of the ordinary atoms uh, uh, that eventually give rise to galaxies and stars. So here is a movie uh, I made uh, very recently. Uh, uh, actually, it wasn't, even, it wasn't made at term, but it was uh, calculations made at term. And uh, here uh, you can see possibly the, the uh, there's no clock here, but there's some clock in 20 units. Doesn't matter, this is the very early universe, this is again dark matter. And now we're switching to visible. Matter. So this is now this gas I was telling you about before, and uh, you don't see the dark matter here, but the dark matter is producing the gravity that's causing these knobs to flow towards one another, and uh, they collide, and uh, they fuse together, building larger and larger structures. And uh, what we've done here is uh, program the computer with the laws of physics as we understand them, and that's what comes out. This is now it stars, and we go back to gas again, uh, and then uh, until the present day, and we will see what came out of this computer. So say so all that goes in is an understanding of physics, uh, of astrophysics as well. There's, um, uh, there's the black hole that uh, is used to be going in the center, the stars that uh, are born, we run out of nuclear fuel and explode. All the astrophysics is encoded in these computer simulations. I think you see the stars again, and uh, we now zoom out because uh, the simulations represent like just one, galaxy with many examples, uh, and this now we can measure many statistical properties of the population of galaxies that forms in the simulations, and they look a lot like what we see in the universe around us. Uh, and Jaime Salcido showed this picture at his talk earlier on in the astrophysics, uh, in the physics symposium. I think he exaggerated a bit when he said that uh, these look exactly like galaxies in nature. Not quite, uh, maybe but well, he's just a crazy student, so he hasn't, <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't seen enough. <laughs> uh, but they do look a lot like the real thing. So these are not real galaxies. These are actually galaxies made in the computer, uh, just based on the laws of physics and these crazy physics about inflation and dark matter. So we are um, uh, nearly at the end. So let me then summarize what I have been telling you about today. So I've been talking about the origin of cosmic structure and how the story goes back to the very early universe, uh, and then to the minus 25 seconds after the Big Bang, when uh, I, I, the universe went through this period of inflation, whereby a small patch of universe inflated very rapidly, and as a result of the quantum processes that caused inflation, the universe was seeded with these small quantum fluctuations. Uh, we see that amazingly the process reflected in the temperature structure of this uh, relic heat left over from the Big Bang, which uh, telescopes are now able to measure with exquisite accuracy. And uh, the, uh, uh, these ripples are seen as hot and cold spots in this cosmic radiation. And as computer simulations show, these are the precursors of the galaxies that we see in the universe today. So, and as I say here, recent measurements uh, give validity uh, uh, or give credits to this parallel. So, is this the end of the story? Well, no. And I can see some astronomers here, Velasquez, and so on, and 
that you want to be out of business. Of course not. <laughs> this is not the end of the story. Uh, there's a number of important open questions. Uh, I like to use uh, one of my favorite fictions, Jeronimus Walsh, uh, The Garden of Earth Delights. It's Earth, it's uh, Hell, it's Paradise. And uh, here on Earth, I put the question, open question of what is the dark matter. And I put it here on Earth because I think this is within grasp. Uh, I think that, as I said earlier, uh, there are many experiments that we talk about them in detail, which are now very close, in my opinion, to in fact making this major breakthrough, which we to discover these particles that we have been talking about, uh, in my case, for 30 years or so. Now, here in hell, I put the problem of dark energy, <laughs> because it really is a hellish problem. Uh, and then for paradise, I reserve the question of how did the universe actually begin? Because uh, you can now do physics and verify it, experimental physics if you like, back to 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. But that's not B equals zero. And I'm sure we all want to know what happened then, even though a chairman here uh, wants to know what would happen in the future, or each day if it's already happened. So uh, let me just finish off uh, by saying that uh, I'd be very fortunate to work on a subject which have seen enormous progress over the past 10 years. This is a view from my office, by the way, in Durham almost, uh, but from my new office, maybe, uh, and uh, there's still a lot to come. So let me just leave you with uh, uh, the words of uh, a, uh, a person that I came across when I was a high school student in Mexico, uh, Alfonso de Simonsario, who, who said, uh, uh, if the Lord Almighty had consulted me before the party of creation, I would have recommended it. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and the other is actually, I don't want to stop here because uh, the universe is actually simple. It's just that uh, it's a great quote. But the universe is simple. <laughs> and I hope uh, you got that message from this lecture tonight. And now I'll stop here.